Hey there, everyone. Another day, another episode. A moment of transparency. I have something else for the channel that I want to work on, so the next holiday that comes that I don't have to visit family, I'll be working on that project. For those curious about holiday frequency, Canadians get a lot of time off. We generally get one more week of vacation time than Americans per year, and we have one paid day off per month, basically. So take that, Americans! No, but seriously, I'm wanting to make the most of these times off to work on other stuff. It's not an enormous project, but with the busy work of uploading two videos a week, I don't have a lot of time left over to work on it. Writing a script from scratch twice a week makes me feel a little bit like Stephen King. I believe he writes 1,000 words per day for his plethora of novels. I'm very near that average right now. Last time, we saw conversations between Orochimaru and Shikamaru, and also between Minato and Jiraiya. Both interactions were on the cusp of a big event. Orochimaru is about to besiege Iwa, and Minato and Jiraiya have just been jumped by Danzo's men. Let's just jump right in, shall we? The Kage building is a pile of rubble. Various village officials were caught in the explosion, pulling several Anbu in the nearest sectors to aid in their recovery. However, even troubles within the village cannot call the attention of all the Anbu, as some need to maintain border security. And they too are scrambling, not only to cover the gaps of their partners, but also because half their number just abandoned their posts. In the moments before the explosion, 10 Anbu of the total 30 collapsed onto the Kage building. Minato sensed their coming, but expected them to be allies. It was almost as if they were aware of the impending violence that was about to take place. But following the explosion and in wake of the alarmed Hokage, they pounced on him. Even the Anbu know that a Kage is nearly unequaled and cannot be assaulted individually. And these 10 Anbu that abandoned their post also proceeded to attack the very man they were charged to protect. Turncoats. Root Anbu. Hiding in their very ranks were the men who served another master. And as much as it pained them, the Anbu who sought vengeance against their allies' betrayal needed to continue protection of the village, now more than ever. Minato spun around, deflecting the many kunai thrown at him from afar, while individuals charged him in the meantime. He expected the ambush, but it was jarring for one of the root Anbu to turn themselves into a living bomb. Minato only escaped the blast zone because he saw Donzo taking an early escape. Sharp as ever, when Jiraiya saw Minato take action, he turned his hair to armor and wrapped himself in it. Though caught in the blast, Jiraiya emerged unharmed. After the initial smoke cleared, Minato realized the damage as his office at the village's center had been reduced to rubble. It was an odd assault. He knew that though they had different perspectives, Donzo still wanted success for the village. So to do this during a war, when their forces were all but emptied from the village, was simultaneously a perfect opportunity and a terrible choice. As he landed safely from the explosion, so did the various root Anbu around him. Meanwhile, the Uchiha ninja, who had clearly shirked on their war duties, surrounded Jiraiya. Calculating the loss from here, the Uchiha clan would only have four or five living members. Unfortunately for them, they've forgotten their new place in the world. They are not nearly as strong as they seem to think they are. Even with a powerful ally like Donzo, they're lambs to the slaughter. They gave up their moral high ground against Donzo to be sacrifices to his cause. Contrary to what they seem to believe, Minato did not want the Uchiha clan to become an extinct house. They were one of the founding families, and their potential strength was so phenomenal. He just couldn't believe that they were so willing to throw their lives away like this. Of course, they were going to face criminal charges for abandoning the war either way. But to commit such a high treason as betraying the village itself was a death sentence in itself. 
Though he never implicitly gave Jiraiya the go-ahead, Minato knew that if their positions were swapped, he'd cut the Uchiha down if they got in his way. And the root Anbu, hiding under his very nose, as his own apparently loyal Anbu? Losing 30% of his Anbu in one fell swoop was a brutal blow to the protection of the village. This one act was alone the catalyst that could stop the war in its tracks, regardless of their progress. He should never have given Donzo any freedom. The idea that so many were fomenting an uprising all this time sickened Minato. Though he would do what needed to be done, even if that meant executing them all, Minato remained conflicted. He'd placed so much trust in the best of the best that the village had to offer. He would end this uprising just as quickly as it began, conjuring a dozen shadow clones as he weaved between spitfire and forked lightning. Each clone conjured a Rasengan and dove after each root Anbu that surrounded him. Though his chakra was divvied up between his clones, each should have had enough to outpace and land a Rasengan on the Anbu. The strike wouldn't kill them, but it would cripple them enough to take away any competitive edge they hoped to have had. Summoning Gamabunta was Jiraiya's first response to being so surrounded. Luckily, the old toad didn't put up too much of a stink to his summoning. But then again, it had been ages since Jiraiya had last called upon him. Standing across from him was Donzo, flanked by two root Anbu. Meanwhile, covering his back end were at least a dozen Uchiha. None of the Uchiha present were currently Jonin, so it struck Jiraiya as odd that they thought they stood any kind of chance against him. Even with the root Anbu helping them, they'd only be obstacles for both sides. He knew all the Anbu operatives in the village and their abilities. Though they knew most of what he could do, they didn't know all. Jiraiya had never shown his sage mode to anyone besides Minato and the other Sanin. Thus, he wasn't worried as much for himself as for the subsequent deaths of his attackers. Donzo rallied many behind the scenes to his cause. That was never a question. Despite being imprisoned for as long as he was, there were clearly going to be villagers who remained loyal to him. Regardless of the outcome from today's conflict, there'd be a resulting schism from Donzo's loss. Of course, Jiraiya also wondered whether Minato saw this coming, or if indeed someone else called him back to the village only for this to happen. Donzo looked the same as ever, except that he now had brazenly removed the bandages on his face. His mutated right arm was devoid of the Sharingan it once had, and he kept it in a sling. But Jiraiya suspected that Donzo was still able to use that arm. It was a lazy feint, an insult to Jiraiya's intelligence. Despite Gamabunta's complaints that he wasn't doing anything, Jiraiya had realized something while observing Donzo. He looked exactly the same as he did, nearly 10 years ago when he was first imprisoned. Perhaps he had aged some, but he should have been weak, frail even. He had the reflexes to dodge the explosion in the Hokage building, despite using a cane to get around. Several people flit through Jiraiya's memory as he struggles to piece together how Donzo could possibly walk free every day without anyone's knowing. And why would he wait until this exact moment to get out? And Donzo must have been free all this time to retain the reaction time to avoid injury from the explosion. Fighting at the core of the city seriously reduced Gamabunta's offensive ability, so Jiraiya told him to only use defensive maneuvers to keep those pesky Uchiha off his back. As Gamabunta attempts to answer him, his throat catches. When Jiraiya repeats the instructions, Gamabunta starts to smash his head to and fro, throwing Jiraiya free. Landing below in confusion, Jiraiya looks up at his summon as he draws his giant sword and thrusts it down at him. In an instant, an entire street obliterated from one swing of Gamabunta's sword. This isn't something that the old toad would ever do, given his personal loyalty to the leaf. Glancing at Donzo, suspecting tricks, Jiraiya sees one of the root Anbu holding the other one up. Foo! Jiraiya growls, throwing together several hand seals. To think that the Yamanaka Anbu had grown strong enough to take control of such a large animal like Gamabunta. 
Leaping at the toad, Jiraiya belts out an obscuring mist in hopes that the Fu possessed Gamabunta doesn't swing blindly. Before landing again, Jiraiya dispels his own summon, sending Gamabunta back to Mount Miyoboku. Turning back to Donzo, Jiraiya wonders if his theory will hold up. If he unsummed Gamabunta before Fu released the possession, then not only would it take a few minutes for his spirit to return to him, but at that distance, it would take days. And now, Jiraiya's figured out who the other guard is, as a great cloud of bugs disperse from him. Donzo always did play favorites with his root. Torun was known for his use of poison, but Jiraiya had his own poison experience from training with the toads. For once, Donzo's favorites weren't doing so well for him. Performing a second summon, Jiraiya pulls out a smaller toad, but he's forgotten himself. Seven kunai plunge into his back as he's ambushed by the Uchiha. Reactively turning his hair into thorned armor, he knocks them all away from himself. In this time, Torun has covered the distance to him, and his bugs are about to strike. Jiraiya reaches through his own armored hair with a Rasengan in his palm, landing square on Torun's chest. The power of the Rasengan sends Torun flying, and his bugs lose their directive, becoming aimless and attempting to return to his body. Weaving his hair into a long tendril of thorns, Jiraiya curls it around the three nearest Uchiha and squeezes until they stop moving. Panting, Jiraiya curses that he dropped his guard so easily. The injuries aren't a joke, but they're not fatal either. The unskilled remnant Uchiha don't even know how to land a fatal strike. Shadows of their former glory. It was too late for his sage form now. He was injured and rattled. Even with the Elder Toads to help, he still needed to sit still for a while. But all that was left was Straggler Uchiha, whose spirits would be close to breaking, and Donzo himself. Even injured, Jiraiya knew that he was enough to handle Donzo. Keeping his hair armored up to prevent another literal backstabbing, Jiraiya marched towards Donzo, who never once moved from his initial spot. Coming within arm's reach of Donzo, Jiraiya shook his head at the man, offended that the latter ever called himself a friend of the third Hokage. Donzo tells Jiraiya that he's been indoctrinated since he was a child. He wouldn't know a better world if it slapped him in the face. Ninja aren't meant to be brutes to swing their fists at each other, Donzo tells him. Ninja are masters of deception, at least that's the way it used to be. Before Jiraiya's eyes, Donzo splits into four as a blur occupying the same space. Without even moving, I can ensure that you never touch me with simple deception, Donzo tells him calmly. Reaching forward with a fist, Jiraiya indeed hits nothing but air, despite aiming for a point that all four blurs occupy. Suddenly, Donzo's hand is on his face, gripping his head, and all Jiraiya can see is a great Sharingan hiding in the palm of Donzo's hand. Appearing between the two, Minato plants a high kick to Donzo's chin, forcing him separate from Jiraiya, who teeters backward. Summon the other Sanin back now, Jiraiya, before you fall unconscious. Minato commands, turning back to Donzo, who's already recovered from the hit. Behind Minato lie ten Anbu corpses, and the remaining Uchiha. Minato wonders if Jiraiya's grown rusty, or if Donzo has some trick up his sleeve. Two more root Anbu appear beside Donzo as he backs away from Minato. At least he knows now that he's outmatched against the Hokage. The years have been unkind to us, Donzo tells him, lifting his cane from the ground as clear indication that he's never needed it. I've been passed over. You've been living in a dream. The world's not so nice to either side, Donzo continues, checking the Sharingan on his palm for damage. You've been corrupted from the very start, Minato answers, pulling out a Raijin kunai. Even if the world did right by you, you'd never be happy. Blinking awake, Asuma looks up at the Genin and Chunin he was meant to rescue with Kurinai. Kurinai? Sitting up fast, Asuma looks for Kurinai, who remains unconscious beside him. Sakura tries to get him to lay back down, but he demands a report on Kurinai's health. Sakura tells him that she's got significant internal bleeding that's beyond her scope. 
Only Lady Tsunade or Shizune could address this injury, but they're too far away. Uncharacteristically, Asuma snaps to his feet almost in a panic and picks Kurenai up. Almost coldly, he tells the kids to reconvene with Orochimaru's forces at Iwa to the southeast. Looking between them for a moment, Asuma nods at them. He tells them that they did well to escape on their own. In hindsight, they probably didn't need any help with Naruto at their side. Never mind Ino, but he doesn't mention her. Without another word, despite their protests, Asuma sprints away with Kurenai at speeds that the kids simply cannot match. Looking between each other perplexed, the remaining Konoha 6 wonder why Asuma was acting so unprofessional. Now that several of them are tuning though, Shino figures they can mobilize themselves responsibly enough. It was certainly strange to abandon two Jinchuriki in the middle of nowhere. Perhaps considering how well they broke out and retained their individuality all the while, maybe they were deemed self-sufficient enough. They all agree that from a strategic angle, Hasuba should not have left them behind. However, without any trees to block their view or path, it would be a straightaway to meet up with Orochimaru. With a siege coming soon, there would likely be very little or no rock ninja out in the middle of nowhere. Sakura tells them they have no time to waste either. A shinobi siege historically lands a few days at its longest. If they're late, they might miss the whole thing. And they have two Jinshuriki that can easily swing the battle should the leaf lose favor. Though they had a bit of a rest while waiting for Asuma to wake up, they're still quite tired. They did a cursory look around right after the fight, but found no evidence of Sasuke or Neji. Those two are either being held at a different area, or they escaped capture altogether. Since time is now of the essence, they must head out immediately. Pulling food pills from her pack, Sakura hands them around and volunteers Shino as the point man for them to follow. Naruto has sensory abilities, but he can't use it on the fly like Shino. Agreeing on the action plan, all six start off across the barren plain. Creeping through the darkness, Baki signals for his small shinobi troop to halt as he finally sees light. They were traveling for days on end through endless tunnels. There were few ninja that got in their way and were easily dispatched. At long last, they'd found the surface again. But they had to stop short as they heard voices through the caves opening. They heard men talking seriously, but they also heard joking. And they heard children's laughter. Keeping his core behind, Baki creeps closer to the cave's exit and sees a bustling park beyond it. His concerned frown turns to a grin as he sidles back to his ninja. He tells them that the cave network has led them to the heart of Iwa. They need only wait for Orochimaru's signal now. This ambush will be much better than Orochimaru could have ever hoped for. And for the time being, they will rest and bide their time. Soon the siege will begin, and Iwa will fall at long last. And that's the end of today's episode. On one hand, all the pieces are falling into place in Iwa. On the other, Jiraiya's been pretty savagely injured, and there have been some major casualties within Konoha's walls. Asuma was certainly acting strange, but it's his relationship with Kurenai that's driving him. In any other circumstance, he wouldn't be so reckless. But perhaps there's some guilt that's hanging over him for exposing Kurenai to such a danger. It's challenging for me to write in a fight that takes place between numerous people at once. The one versus one fights are pretty easy to manage. Heck, I'm pretty confident with three person fights as well. But it's these big fights that I struggle with, so I try to zoom in on what's important. Additionally, I know a lot of people have been repeatedly predicting Minato's death through these various commotions, and he's been winning everything pretty handily. I'm just trying to illustrate his capability and how his is around the same as the other Kage. It might feel like Rasa is weaker, but in a full-on fight, I'm not so sure who would win. I like Minato more, so subjectively I'd vote for him. But due to the power scaling I've tried to implement, the answer to this question isn't actually that clear. Anyway, that's enough rambling for today. I'll see everyone again on Monday. The sky's the limit.